Good morning. So today I want to talk real quick about food sensitivities and then I'm going to dive deeper into um, gluten-free and dairy-free and some of the other things that I specifically do. But this is just kind of a general overview um, and I'm sure some of the other coaches might bring some of this up as well and talk a little bit about it. But um, food sensitivities is important to me because I discovered three years ago that I had some. And just a quick background, it was three, almost four years ago now, I guess. Um, I would have bet money that I did not have an issue with gluten. Would, I, would have, I would have bet anything that that was not my problem, that there was something else wrong with me. And I went um, to a functional medicine doctor, we did some testing, and lo and behold, I had sensitivities to gluten, wheat, casein, um, and scallops. But I don't eat scallops, but, um, and because of that, I had some gut, leaky gut issues um, and some other stuff going on, discovered I had some digestive issues. So there's been a whole slew of things. And it's been, honestly, it's been a roller coaster for me um, since discovering that, trying to heal the gut, figure out how to, um, to eat and navigate these food sensitivities and, um, and do all the things that I needed to do to feel better and to be able to digest better. And some of that requires me to do some supplementing um, to help with low stomach acid and things like that. And these are things that, you know, you wouldn't want to talk about. It's going to help you kind of start discovering, do you have some issues that you need to see a um, doctor or um, talk to somebody about to dive a little bit deeper into. Um, and then I'm going to give you a quick little tip to, um, if you don't want to go out and spend money on um, blood work or um, stool testing or any of that kind of stuff, uh, an easy way that you can try to um, kind of investigate on your own and figure this out. So first of all, food sensitivities are basically um, your body is reacting to um, a food to particles of food or whatever in your body. When you have leaky gut, which I, again, I thought leaky gut was, you know, it's one of those, one of those things that's not real until I've discovered that I had it in the test. We're saying that I had this problem and this is why you have this problem. So just real quick, easy way to think about it. Your gut has, um, you know, your gut lining is not a solid sheet. It has these, you know, little villi or whatever that they allow the good stuff to go through and keep the bad stuff out. Well, when you have, you know, think of it as maybe it's like this. When you have leaky gut, it's opening. There's these holes, there's these gaps within the gut where food particles, things that should not get into your bloodstream, leak through and get into the bloodstream. And that's what causes these um, autoimmune flare-ups, inflammation, and other issues. So when you think about food sensitivities, I want you to, to not just narrow it down to only being um, a problem within your gut or you know how you feel stomach-wise. Um, it can flare up in, in your skin, um, your brain fog, your moods. You could find you know that you're, you have anxiety or depression that is stemming from issues within the gut. So that's one of the reasons that I personally um, love going to a functional medicine doctor and I, I recommend people seeing functional medicine um, doctors, practitioners, nutritionists, because they're not just going to um, look at your symptoms and try to mask your symptoms. They're going to try to figure out what is causing that symptom so that they can correct that and get you back to where you need to be. Um, now, a lot of doctors will, they want to just run every test there is to test because sometimes it's just easier to run the test and, you know, have the data that says here, this is what the problem is. But, you know, sometimes you can't always pinpoint from some of those tests and some of the tests are expensive. So don't just go out and get, you know, say, I want to have all this blood work and stool samples and all these things done. Okay. You can figure some stuff out on your own. Um, so again, back to the food, food sensitivities. You can have a food allergy, which people know, you know, like a nut allergy, you eat peanuts and you get this massive anaphylactic reaction. And sometimes you, it can kill you. You have to have um, an EpiPen, stuff like that. There are milder um, versions of that where it's not an allergy to a food, but it's a sensitivity or an intolerance to something. Um, and there's, there's basically 90% of food allergies and reactions come from peanuts, 
tree nut, milk, eggs, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. That's kind of the big overarching. That's where most problems come from. And then there's little things um, within that. People can have sensitivities to anything and everything. You could be allergic to or have a sensitivity to strawberries. I think I have a mild sensitivity to like pineapple or something. Um, so there's lots of things, there's lots of variations or, or varying degrees of sensitivity that you can develop um, through food. Sometimes it is um, an accumulation of how much you're eating. So you might not notice anything at all if you eat this thing, you know, once. But if you have it two or three days in a row or two or three meals within a day, you might notice that you have a problem with it. So um, like, you know, lactose intolerance. Somebody who's lactose intolerant has a little dairy. Maybe they don't have too much issue, but if they have, you know, a whole uh, pint of ice cream along with some cheese at lunch and some milk for breakfast, you know, they're going to feel like they're about to explode. So that's, you know, that's kind of how you have to think about it is that it, it can be, it can be a very, very mild symptom. It could be in the gut. It could be the skin. It could be your hair and nails. It could be your vision, your moods, your, um, your mental acuity, your ability to sleep well, all of these things are affected by what's going on in the gut and can be affected by the food that you're eating if you have a problem with it. Um, so again, for me, I found out that I have gluten, wheat, dairy, or casein, um, and scallops. So the, for me, it started with, it started with the gut issues. It started with feeling, um, you know, I, I feel like I had rocks in my stomach because I wasn't digesting properly, which part of that was not so much the food, but low um, stomach acid. I would be bloated. I would wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, like I got abs. And then by afternoon, after eating a couple of meals, I felt like I was, you know, starting to look like I had a little pregnant belly. Um, you know, other things, bowel changes happened, um, skin issues. There's all kinds of things that just started piling up. And at the time I had no idea what was going on and why this was happening. So I went to the functional medicine doctor. Of course I described everything um, in detail of what I was feeling. I knew exactly what I was eating because at the time I was tracking it all. I was planning it. I was very, very detailed on my food, which is extremely important as Jason said. Um, so I knew exactly what I was eating. We were able to, you know, we did food sensitivity tests um, and discovered what was causing it. And again, I, I could have swore there would not be any issues with gluten. Lo and behold, I had been eating a little bit more dairy, a little bit more um, gluten than I maybe normally would have been because of the uh, calorie, the macro counts I was trying to hit. So it just, and that, and with the added stress of the workouts and everything, then teaching classes that I was doing at the time, it all kind of piled on and created this like, you know, explosion of issues within my gut. So that all being said, I'm going to give you tips on what you can do. One, to try to investigate for yourself um, and see if this is maybe something, there's something that's bothering you that you should um, think about. And then also a way that you can further the investigation and try to um, correct some of the problems. So first of all, um, like Jason said before, the one thing, one thing, if you're going to do one thing this whole month, um, is tracking. Track what you eat somehow write it down. Even if you're not going in detail to the gram of what you're eating, track everything you are eating. So you know exactly each day what you are putting into your body. Also with that, a good idea is to track how you feel. How do you feel that morning when you wake up? How do you feel after that meal? How do you feel that night? How was your sleep quality? How many times do you go to the bathroom? What does your poop look like? Let's be honest. There's a lot you can learn from what's going on inside your digestive system by what your poop looks like. So I'm not going to get into that here. If you want to know more, we can talk more um, maybe privately about that. But these are all things that are good to know. They're, it's good to document this stuff. If you eat certain foods and then immediately after or later that day, you start having symptoms 
then you can start tying it back. Okay, so maybe, you know, I don't have that tomorrow. Do I still have the symptoms? I don't have it for two or three days. Do I still have the symptoms? I have it only once a week. Do I get symptoms? I've had it three days in a row. Am I all of a sudden getting these symptoms? These are the kind of things that if you were tracking, you can look back. You have that data to look back at and, and use. If you're not tracking, do you remember what you had yesterday for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks? Maybe, maybe. Do you remember what you had two days ago? If you didn't take pictures of it or write it down, do you remember what you had on um, Sunday or Saturday? You may not. I certainly don't. I couldn't tell you everything I ate um, two days ago. I could tell you yesterday. I did track it. I could tell you yesterday, but Monday I probably would forget some stuff. So that's why tracking is good. Not only tracking what you're putting in your body, but how you feel and what symptoms, what things are arising. Do you all of a sudden get this rash um, on your neck, on your back, on your hands? Do you all of a sudden feel really gassy and bloated? You should not feel gassy and bloated after eating. You shouldn't. If you're digesting well and you're eating good food, your body should not respond that way. It's not normal to be gassy all the time, even though we make fun of it and you know we say that we are. Um, these are things that you want to you want to note and you want to recognize in your um, in your your food journal, your tracking. Um, and then from there, the next step would be if you discover, look, I'm having these issues. I think something is causing my body to react in a negative way. I want to try to figure it out. I don't want to go to the doctor and spend a bunch of money. The simple, easy way to do that is through an elimination diet. And I know diet is the bad word, but don't want to say that, but it's an elimination diet. And it's exactly what it means. You're going to eliminate things. Then you slowly reintroduce and you repeat until you can confirm what, if anything was causing you problems. So when you go through an elimination diet, you usually go through the main, kind of the main things that cause people problems. Gluten for sure. Um, dairy is a really good one. So a lot of times beans, coffee. I know sometimes people eliminating coffee might be a really pro a, a, a problem. Um, citrus, processed foods of all kinds, definitely get rid of that. I mean, just get rid of that permanently. It's probably a good idea, but get rid of that. Um, hydrogenated oils are really bad. You should get rid of that. Uh, sugar, sugar, and sometimes even some of the sugar substitutes can cause issues. So, you know, it, I, I'm not going to lie. I did this and it was a struggle because it all of a sudden made me have to rethink what am I going to eat because all and eggs, that was a big one for me. That was, that one was probably the hardest was to get rid of the eggs. I'm like, well, what am I going to eat for breakfast? I can't have dairy. I can't have eggs. I can't have gluten. So it's like everything that I would normally have eaten for breakfast is now off the table. So it is a struggle and, it, and I'm not going to lie. It's not going to be easy. Um, and you need to do it for at least, at least three weeks, eliminate stuff, I completely eliminated at least three weeks, minimum, preferably more like maybe six weeks to maybe getting close to a month, two months, three months. That's the longer you can eliminate it, the better. One, it's going to make it much easier to never have it again if it is a problem because you have lived so long not having it, you get used to not having it. You will discover so many new things that you can eat and different ways to eat. Um, you know, like for example, breakfast doesn't have to be breakfast, your traditional breakfast food. You can eat anything. You're breaking your fast. Eat whatever you want. If you want to have a steak and broccoli for breakfast, go for it. It's food. As long as it's good food, it's food. It doesn't matter what time of the day you throw it in there. I personally love breakfast food. I would eat breakfast food all day long if I could. And sometimes I do. So don't, we have to break that cycle of, you know, breakfast is this type of food, lunch is this type of food, and dinner is this type of food. And my snacks have to be this kind of food. Your food, as long as it's real food, it doesn't matter when you have it or what you have it or, or what, what time of day you have it, what meal you have it at. Your, you know, your snacks could be a smaller version of what you had for breakfast or lunch. I mean, that's, that's where you want to get to. And the elimination diet will kind of help push you into that because you have to rethink food when you eliminate so many things. So again, you eliminate the big eight, <laughs> the, the big main things that people um, have allergies to that I already mentioned. And then the common food things like gluten and dairy and, um, and eggs and caffeine and all that kind of stuff.
And again, if you want to know more, we can talk more about it. So you go through, you eliminate all this stuff, you relearn how you're eating, you're still tracking everything you eat and how you feel. And it's going to take time for whatever reaction your body was having to go away, to kind of settle down. Um, especially if it is a like a massive reaction, something that's really been built up. I mean, it can take months and months for you to be able to heal the gut if you're having you know leaky gut or something like that. And especially if you don't take out those things that are causing that leaky gut. So after at least three weeks, if your symptoms haven't subsided, you need to go a little bit longer. If they have subsided, then you can think about, all right, I wanna reintroduce something. And you pick one thing and you reintroduce that one thing for a week. And it's not just a once, you know, if you do it once and you have a, a immediate reactions where well, you know that's a problem, take it back out. If you have it once and there's nothing, then you make sure you have a little bit more, have it twice, have a little bit more. You wanna be able to, com you know, compound it up a little bit to see, do I, do I react to this at some point? And if you go a whole week and you've eaten this stuff multiple times through the week, multiple times a day, and you're not having any reaction, well then, that one's permanently back in and you move on to the next thing. So it is a long drawn out process, which yes, yeah, sometimes it's nice to just go and say, all right, here's my food sensitivity test. And it says that I have these issues. I'm just gonna eliminate those things and see how I feel. That's certainly a route you could take if you wanna spend the money on the blood work. Sometimes it's not very um, cheap and sometimes insurance won't pay for it. So the elimination diet is your free version of doing this. So again, you eliminate all the things. You add one thing back um, for one week and test. That's, that's what you're doing. You're, you're scientists studying your body right now. You're um, testing how do you react to this thing? Do you react if it's a little bit? Do you react if there's a lot of it? So you know that's important that you increase the amount of, of that thing you're having in one sitting or in one day to see if it creates a reaction. If not, you move on to the next thing and you just keep going with this, adding one thing back. If you find reactions, take it out. If you don't find reactions, keep it in and keep going. And you're always tracking, you're always want that data. You need data to go back to. And again, think of this as a scientist, you know, you're researching, you're studying your body, you're studying how things work and how you react and you cannot make assumptions or, or conclusions without data to review. So um, once again, once you've confirmed that it does or doesn't, you move on to the next one and eventually you add back everything that you wanna add back, which shouldn't be your hydrogenated oils, should be very minimally processed foods, if any processed foods whatsoever. Um, really anything refined, sugars and stuff, you wanna just take those out and get them out permanently. Um, you know, alcohol, I mean, if you like to drink, have a, have a drink. I'm going to actually talk about some of the, the wine that I like, um, that is, that is, you know, I won't say good for you, but that is a better, um, version if you're, if you want to have wine. So there's lots of ways to, once you add stuff back in or add similar stuff back in, you're not, you're not going back to where you were. You're at a much better place. You know, what's going on in your body you can now um, enjoy some things and better versions of them is what I'm trying to say. So that is all I have for today. I know I probably went overboard here a little bit, but I wanted to get that in there. I am going to share um, what I, would I use gluten-free products? I'm gonna share some products on here for you guys as well, because I know that can be a good thing. Um, even if you don't feel that you have a gluten sensitivity, it never hurts to remove some of it, um, especially when it comes to like breads, the processed, heavily processed stuff. So that is it. I will see you next time.